Hello everyone. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to our first step of learning the course Physics for Engineers. With the crisis that we are facing today, it is more important not to stop learning. So this is the new normal. Yes, we find it hard just as hard it seems for you. But your desire to learn motivates us to strategize the learning mode suitable in our times. Though it is definitely not perfect, we let you know that we're here to teach and to listen while maintaining COVID-19 safety protocols. Now prepare yourself, clear your mind, and concentrate. Check your learning materials. Sharpen your pencil. Make sure your calculator has plenty of juice, I mean power because we will do a lot of calculations. And of course your writing pad or notebook. These materials from the old normal should not be left behind. So keep them always in your bag just like pretending you are going to school. Now before we begin our discussion, it is expected that you have already learned, during your senior high school days, the basics of physics such as scalars and vectors, algebra, geometry, trigonometry, and calculus. So you better brush up with these topics. So without further ado, let us begin. This first unit deals with motion. Motion is the progressive change of position of a body. Each object in the universe moves relatively with one another. A body which is moving to one observer may be at rest as seen by the other observer. When the relative distance between the object and observer is changing, then motion can be observed. The two objects are at rest, or no motion, when there is no relative change in distance between them. To illustrate this, Consider a stop sign and an athlete. Initially, at a particular time, the athlete is 10 meters away from the stop sign. If he gets closer to the stop sign, let's say his distance becomes 5 meters, therefore we can say that motion takes place between them. The phenomenon of motion can be learned by studying kinematics a branch of mechanics that deals with the description of motion of bodies. It involves various physical quantities such as position, distance, displacement, time, speed, velocity, and acceleration. These quantities are actually related to other quantities such as force, work and power which will be discussed in Unit 2. The position, X or Y of a body is defined in terms of a frame of reference. It is our choice of coordinate x's that defines a starting point, or origin o, for describing motion or any other quantity. For one-dimensional motion, frame of reference may be either x or y axis. Horizontal motion uses x axis while vertical motion uses y axis. Projectile motion, a two-dimensional type of motion, uses both axes in describing position. Now let us distinguish, displacement from distance. Once motion takes place in a body, its position has changed. This change in position is described by the quantity called displacement. In one-dimensional motion, displacement is denoted by delta x, for horizontal motion, and delta y for, vertical motion. Mathematically, it is the difference between the final position of the body x sub f and its initial position x sub i. For instance, a car moves horizontal changes its position relative from the stop sign, which is the chosen arbitrary origin, from 10 meters to 22 meters. If we apply the formula, its displacement is 22 meters minus 10 meters which is equal to positive 12 meters. Take note that displacement is always final position minus the initial position never the reverse. Displacement is a vector quantity, so it has both magnitude and direction. For one-dimensional motion, the sign dictates the direction of displacement. Since our answer is a positive value, therefore the car moves to the right or towards positive axis relative to stop sign. For vertical motion, Displacement delta y is expressed as y sub f minus y sub i. Displacement is independent on the actual path of the body. To explain this, consider again the athlete that can run on different routes of the track. 
His goal is to run from his current position to the other end. To do this, he may run on the upper route. He can also even go the lower route. Either the case, he reached his destination. So here is the athlete's displacement. It depends only on the initial position and final position. It is a straight line segment directed from initial position, or starting point, to final position, or end point, regardless of the path the body moved. On the other hand, distance d is the total length of the path a body actually traveled. Now let us do some solving problems about displacement and distance. Problem number 1. In the figure below, a car moves horizontally, that is along x-axis. The position of the car at each point are indicated by letters. What is the displacement and distance traveled by the car from point A to point B? From point C to point D? From point D to point F? From point A to point E? From point B to point G? And from point F to point G? Now let establish the given information. Referring to the figure, we see the position of the car X at indicated points. At point A, 0. At point B, 30 meters. At point C, 50 meters. Then after reaching 50 meters, momentarily the car has stopped and started to move backwards. Now at point D the position of the car is 40 meters. At point E, the car has returned to starting point, therefore its position is again 0. It continuously moves backward to point F, at negative 30 meters. And lastly to negative 50 meters at point G. Now we investigate the required quantities, take a look again with problem. So we make a list of these below. Now I will show you the solution. Please listen carefully. For displacement delta x, we simply get the difference between the final position x sub f and the initial position x sub i. So from point A to point B, the displacement is x sub B minus x sub A, that is 30 meters minus 0. So the answer is positive 30 meters. For the distance traveled by the car, we see in the figure that it has traveled 30 meters. Take note that the sign indicates the direction of the car. Positive sign indicates that the car moves to the right from point A to point B. We also know that the displacement and distance are numerically equal since the direction of the car from point A to point B does not change. I hope you can still follow. For displacement from point C to point D, that is X sub D minus X sub C. Then substituting the values 40 meters minus 50 meters will give negative 10 meters. The negative sign here indicates that the car moves to the left from point C to point D. For the distance traveled, it is simply 10 meters. Note that distance is a scalar quantity. It has no direction and it only measures the length of path. By the way, before we continue, I suggest you take down important notes while listening. You can also read the module provided in PDF format for better understanding. Now let's move on. For displacement from point D to point F, it is X sub F minus X sub D. Numerically, negative 30 meters minus 40 meters, gives negative 70 meters. Again, the negative sign indicates that the car moves to the left from D to F. For the distance traveled, you see in the figure that it has traveled 40 meters from D to E then another 30 meters from point D to point F. So the total is 70 meters. Now if we take a look on the figure, the positions of the car at points A and E are the same and that is zero, therefore the displacement is zero. Remember that a zero displacement means that the object returns to initial or original position. However, the distance traveled is not zero because it the car has traveled 50 meters from it to C then another 50 meters from C to E. Hence, the total distance traveled from point A to point E is 100 meters. So let's keep up. 
for displacement from point B to point G, subtracting X sub B from X sub G, that is negative 50 meters minus 30 meters gives negative 80 meters. Again, the car seems to move to the left from points B to G. For the distance traveled, before going to point G, it has traveled 20 meters from B to C, 50 meters from C to E and another 50 meters from E to G. So the total is 120 meters. I hope that at this moment you can now distinguish between distance and displacement. Displacement only depends entirely on the initial and final positions of the object while distance is a path-dependent kinematic quantity. We're almost done. The last item would be the displacement and distance from point F to point G. The displacement between these points is X sub G minus X sub F which is equal to negative 50 meters minus negative 30 meters. So the answer is negative 20 meters. This item may be a tricky one. Take note the initial position is a negative value. Its sign should not be mistakenly replaced by the minus sign at the middle. So watch out for this. For the distance, obviously from the figure it is 20 meters. Well, that's it. Any questions so far? If so, kindly communicate with your teacher. Now let us see what have you learned by answering exercise number 1. But before that, I'll show you the general instructions you should consider in doing exercises. Number 1. Strictly follow the format shown. Number 2. Write the given information, required quantities and detailed solution on short bond paper. Number 3. Box or highlight your final answer. Number 4. Submit your output on designated place in school on or before the date assigned by your teacher. Number 5. You may also submit your output in either attaching the Microsoft Word or PDF format file or simply a plain text in the messenger. Choose the most convenient for you. Now here is your first exercise. Using the information in problem number 1, determine the displacement and distance traveled from point A to point C, from point B to point E, and from point A to G. Good luck! Hello! Welcome back! I hope you successfully answered your first exercise. You may collaborate with your classmate to compare your answers with them. Somehow, it will give you the confidence with your answers before submitting it to your teacher. Now let us move on to another two important quantities, speed and velocity, which is much related to displacement and distance. To describe how fast a body moves, average speed is computed. Average speed, denoted by letter S, is the distance a body moves in a given unit of time. Regardless of different paths traveled by a body, total distance d, or path length, are measured and divided to the total time elapsed, or time interval, delta t. Mathematically, it is expressed as s equals distance d divided by the time interval delta t. Distance traveled and time interval are always positive values, so as with speed. The SI unit of speed is meter per second. Other units are kilometers per hour, or kph, feet per minutes, or fpm, and miles per hour, or mph. The magnitude of speed varies with the ability of the object to move. A man can walk at an average speed of 1 meter per second while a car can travel as much as 25 meters per second. Modern cruise ships can travel on waters about 30 knots, or 55 kph. Modern airplanes and jet planes can travel as much as the speed of sound, that is around 300 meters per second. Mach is a unit used to measure the speed of these vehicles. A Mach means a speed equivalent to the speed of sound. Mach 2 represents a speed twice that of sound. The Earth's equator is actually moving at around 460 meters per second. Now before we define velocity and distinguish it with speed, I will give you one easy problem about speed. Problem number 2. In the figure below, a car has traveled a distance of 60 meters on the indicated path in 3 seconds. 
What is the average speed of the car? Establishing given information based on problem statement will give a distance traveled of 60 meters and a time interval of 3 seconds. For the required quantity, we need to solve for the average speed s. Then we solve this using the formula of speed s equal distance d divided by the time interval delta t. Substituting the given information. So the average speed of the car is 20 meters per second. You find it easy? I told you. But take note this is only the average speed of the car. If we are asked to solve for the maximum speed of the car, well, we do not have enough given information to solve it. But we will investigate this one once we discuss the concept of instantaneous velocity and instantaneous speed. Now we're moving to velocity, which is sometimes synonymously compared to speed. Average velocity, denoted by V sub A V E, is time rate at which the displacement occurs. Mathematically, velocity is expressed as delta x over delta t, wherein displacement delta x is equal to final position x sub f minus the initial position x sub i, and delta t is equal to final time t sub f minus the initial time t sub i. You make some adjustment on the formula when you are dealing with vertical motion. To comprehend these things, Let's say we have a car that moves along horizontal road or along x-axis. The average velocity of the car can be described. First, we set an arbitrary, or you know, say the stop sign, in order to describe car's position at any point in time. So let's say at initial time t sub i, which is zero, the car's initial 10 meters from the stop sign. Then, the car moves and reached the final position 20 meters 2 seconds later. So the car's displacement is positive 10 meters for a time interval of 2 seconds. Hence the average velocity of the car, which is delta x over delta t, is positive 5 meters per second. Middle dot the value sign of the velocity depends on the sign of the displacement. Although displacement can be a positive value or a negative value. Time interval is always a positive value. Furthermore, the direction of the velocity is the same as the direction of the displacement. Middle dot for one dimensional motion, it is sufficient to use positive or negative for directions. Middle dot the C unit of velocity is meter per second but customary units such as feet per second, centimeter per second, kilometer per hour and others may be used. Since speed and velocity are synonymous with each other, it is important to note that the magnitude of velocity may be equal or less than the numerical value of speed. First, if the magnitude of displacement is less than the total distance traveled by a body, the magnitude of the velocity is less than speed's magnitude. To explain this, let's say we have a car which traveled 100 meters along the indicated path in 5 seconds. The average speed of the car is 20 meters per second. Now we see that the magnitude of displacement is definitely less than 100 meters, let's say 30 meters. With this value magnitude of its velocity is 6 meters per second, which is less than the value of speed 20 meters per second. Secondly, for one dimensional motion, the magnitude of displacement and distance are equal, and therefore the magnitude of velocity and speed are also equal. Lastly, velocity is zero when the body returns from starting point while the its speed is greater than zero. Maybe it's about time to solve another problem. Problem number three the figure below shows the position x of the car as a function of time t. Find the average velocity and average speed of the car in figure below between time interval 0 seconds to 12 seconds given information are at initial time 0 second the position is 0 at time 12 seconds the car's position x sub f is negative 30 meters so again we are asked to solve for the car's average velocity and average speed in this time interval solution for average velocity we use the formula delta x over delta t substituting the values negative 30 meters minus 0 over 12 seconds minus 0 will give an average velocity of negative 2.5 meters per second 
Note that the negative value of velocity means that the car moves to the left or towards x-axis during the 12 seconds time interval. For average speed, that is distance t over time interval, we have 50 meters plus another 50 meters and another 30 meters. So the total is 130 meters then divided by 12 seconds gives a speed of 10.83 meters per second. The answers show that the average speed is greater than the magnitude of the average velocity since the distance traveled during this time interval is higher than the magnitude of displacement. Now it's your turn. Let us see what have you learned about speed and velocity. Don't forget to follow the general instructions explained in exercise number 1. This second exercise is composed of two problems. Number 1, referring to the figure below, determine the average speed and average velocity between time interval 0 seconds to 10 seconds, and 12 seconds to 15 seconds. After answering this problem, you may proceed to the next. Number 2. In a car racing competition, two cars A and B are approaching the finish line. Car A and B move in a straight line at constant speeds of 30 meters per second and 25 meters per second, respectively. If car A and B respectively are 100 meters and 60 meters away from the finish line, which car gets to the finish line first and by how much time ahead? Once again, congratulations for answering exercise number 2. We have learned earlier that the position of an object is a function of time. As time advances, the position may change depending on how a body moves. With this relationship, we can investigate motion graphically. Here we are going to learn two motional graphs, the position time graph and the velocity time graph. Let us begin with the position time graph. Position time graph, xt or yt graph is a graph of body's position as a function of time. It is composed of two coordinates, vertical and horizontal coordinate. The vertical coordinate represents body's position while horizontal coordinate represents timeline. The figure below shows how the position of moving car relative to stop sign is being translated to the position time graph. The shape of the curve is determined on the actual positions of the car between time 0 second to 2 second. By just looking at the graph without seeing the car for as long as this graph represents its motion, we can determine its position at any point in time from 0 second to 2 seconds. At 0 second its position is 10 meters from the arbitrary origin. At 1 second it is around 16 meters. And at 2 seconds it is 20 meters. Position time graph is a very important tool in analyzing motion. One of its uses is that if we plot two points on the graph which corresponds to a given time interval, let's say between 0 seconds to 2 seconds, and then connect these two points with a straight line, we see that this line has a slope. From geometry, slope is computed by dividing the rise to the run of the line. We see that the rise is simply the displacement delta x, which is final position minus the initial position, 20 meters minus 10 meters, so the rise is positive 10 meters. The run is the time interval delta t, 2 seconds minus 0 s, so it's run 2 seconds. So the slope is 5 meters per second which is also the value of the average velocity. Therefore, we can say that the slope of the line between two points on the position time graph is equal to the average velocity of the object. Now let us give another example. Problem number 4. The figure below shows the position x of the car as a function of time t. Letter A. Sketch the position time graph of the car. Assume that the maximum and minimum positions are 50 meters and negative 50 meters, respectively. B. Referring to the graph, determine the average velocity of the car between time interval 2 seconds to 5 seconds, 5 seconds to 12 seconds and 0 second to 10 seconds. So again, according to problem statement, we are going to draw a position time graph and the average velocity at each time interval listed below. To do this we need a graphing paper, 
then plot the position of car at each indicated time. At 0 second, 0 meter. At 2 seconds, 30 meters. At 5 seconds, 50 meters. Then the car started to move backwards. And at 7 seconds, 40 meters. At 10 seconds, the car has returned to origin. At 12 seconds, negative 30 meters. And lastly, at 15 seconds, negative 50 meters. Then connect the plotted point with a smooth curve. Although the curve is only an estimation, since we are limited with the information, it should look like this. Now for the average velocity, we just connect the points on each required time interval, then compute the slope of each line by dividing its rise to its run. So for 2 seconds to 5 seconds, so this is the line and the slope or the average velocity is 50 meters minus 30 meters, divided by 5 seconds minus 2 seconds. The average velocity between this time interval is positive 6.67 meters per second. For 5 seconds to 12 seconds, doing the same procedure. Create a line and get the slope that is negative 30 meters minus 50 meters dividing 12 seconds minus 5 seconds will give an average velocity of negative 11.42 meters per second. Our slope is sloping downward, therefore we have negative average velocity at this time interval. From 0 second to 10 seconds, we see that this line is a horizontal line so the slope is 0, and therefore the average velocity between this time interval is also 0. In the previous section, we have discussed the average velocity of a body at a given time interval. Remember that average velocity does not describe the velocity of a body at a given period of time. Referring to the position time graph shown, the average velocity of the body between time interval 0 seconds to 2 seconds is the slope of this line, so it is 10 meters the rise divided by the run 2 seconds will give an average velocity of positive 5 meters per second. Now let us say, we want to know the velocity of the car at instant the time is 0 second. To answer this, we introduce another type of velocity called instantaneous velocity. It indicates what is happening at any point of time. Mathematically, instantaneous velocity v is the limit of the average velocity as the time interval becomes infinitesimally short, or as the time interval approaches 0. It is also the first derivative of the position with respect to time dx over dt. Now let us illustrate this, to determine the instantaneous velocity of the body at time 0 second using the position time graph, we bring the final point f closer to the initial point i. Take note the time at the initial point i is 0. As you can see, the run of the slope or the time interval is decreased. And as you continuously move the final point F closer and closer to point I, the time interval is getting smaller and smaller until such time that the final point I approaches the initial point I, hence the time interval approaches to zero. Surprisingly, the line seems to intersect at a single point on the graph and it is very small. Now we try to stretch this line. This line is called the tangent line at initial point I where the time is zero second. And the slope of this tangent line represents the instantaneous velocity at time zero. If we try to compute the slope, so the rise is around 22.5 meters minus 10 meters equal 12.5 meters and the run is 1 minus 0 equals 1 second. Then dividing these, hence the instantaneous velocity, or simply, the velocity of the body at time zero second is positive 12.5 meters per second. Now let us say that you are driving a car and you notice that the speedometer reads 25 miles per hour. Is the reading the velocity or speed of the car? Actually, the magnitude of the instantaneous velocity is what you read on a car's speedometer. And this magnitude of the instantaneous velocity is also the instantaneous speed of the body. In succeeding sections, when we use the term velocity we always mean instantaneous velocity. Let us solve this problem. Problem number 5. A particle moves along the x-axis. 
Its position varies with time according to the expression position x equals 2 times t squared minus 4t, where x is in meters and t is in seconds. The position time graph for this motion is shown in the figure. Because the position of the particle is given by a mathematical function, the motion of the particle is completely known. Notice that the particle moves in the negative x direction for the first second of motion, is momentarily at rest at the moment time t equals 1 second, and moves in the positive x direction at times t greater than 1 second. Letter A. Determine the displacement of the particle in the time interval 0 to 1 second and 1 second to 3 second. Letter B. Calculate the average velocity during these two time intervals. Letter C. Find the instantaneous velocity and instantaneous speed of the particle at time 2.5 second. So here we have given position equation x equals 2t squared minus 4t. Required quantities are displacement delta x and average velocity from 0 second to 1 second and from 1 second to 3 second. Also, instantaneous velocity v and instantaneous speed s at 2.5 second. For delta x from 0 to 1 second, first thing we need to do is to determine the initial and final positions for specified time interval. If we refer the position time graph we see that, x sub i equals 0 and x sub f equal negative 2 meters. Another approach that you can do, in absence of graph or if you find difficulty in reading the exact value of the position, we can solve the positions using position equation by substituting the values of time t. So using the position equation if t equals 0 second, x sub i is equal to 0. If t is 1 second, Using the position equation again, x sub f is negative 2 meters. These values agree with the values shown in the graph. So the displacement delta x from 0 to 1 second is negative 2 meters. We use similar approach for delta x from 1 second to 3 second. Referring to the graph we get x sub i is negative 2 meters and x sub f 5 meters, so the displacement is 7 meters. Again, you can self-check the values of x sub i and x sub f using the position equation. For average velocity, we simply divide these displacements with the time intervals delta t. The average velocity for time interval 0 to 1 second is negative 2 meters per second. For time interval 1 to 3 seconds, the average velocity is positive 3.5 meters per second. Now, take a look carefully. Basically, you can also use calculus-based approach as alternative solution. We said earlier that the first derivative of the position equation x with respect to time t will give velocity equation. So we get the first derivative of the position equation as 4t minus 4 and this is called the velocity equation. This equation can be used to determine the instantaneous velocity at any time t. Now let us see if this thing works. Let's say between 0 to 1 second, we solve the instantaneous velocities using the generated velocity equation. At time 0 second, the initial velocity v sub i is negative 4 meters per second. At time 1 second, the final velocity v sub f is 0. Lastly, we solve the average velocity by simply averaging these two velocities. So we have negative 2 meters per second. This result conforms with our answer using delta x divided by delta t. Find it challenging? Try this method for time interval 1 to 3 second. For instantaneous velocity v and instantaneous speed at 2.5 second, there are two ways in doing this, using position time graph and using velocity equation. From the position time graph, draw a tangent line with the curve at time 2.5 second. The slope of this tangent gives the instantaneous velocity at this time. Just be more cautious in estimating the tangent line to the values of rise and run more accurate. I choose this as rise. I think this is around 5 meters minus negative 1 meter. And the run is 3 second minus 2 second. Dividing rise by run, 
so the instantaneous velocity at 2.5 seconds is 6 meters per second. From here, the instantaneous speed s is simply 6 meters per second. It is just the magnitude of the instantaneous velocity. If you find this graphical approach tedious, don't worry. Now I will show you an easier approach. Again, we can use the velocity equation we have constructed earlier from the first derivative of position equation that is v equals 4 tons minus 4. We just solve for the value of v when the value of time t is 2.5 seconds. So we get also the value 6 meters per second. Now it's your turn. Answer exercise number 3. Using the position time graph of a particle shown below, determine the following, letter A, the average velocity from point A to B. Letter B, the instantaneous velocity at time 10 seconds and letter C, the instantaneous velocity at time 40 seconds. Hello, we meet again. How are you? I hope you're fine. Have you answered exercise number 3? If yes, then congratulations. If no, then study again and try to focus more or talk to your teacher. In this lesson, I will introduce another kinematic quantity called acceleration. Maybe you experience change in speed or velocity, especially when you are riding a car, either when the car is speeding up or slowing down as time goes by. We may say that the car is either accelerating or decelerating. In physics, this change in velocity as a function of time is called acceleration. In this section, same as with velocity and speed, we will explore average acceleration and instantaneous acceleration. Average acceleration, denoted by A sub A V E, is the time rate of change of the velocity, or instantaneous velocity. Mathematically is expressed as change in velocity delta v over time interval delta t. That is also final velocity v sub f minus initial velocity v sub i divided by the final time t sub f minus initial time t sub i. The SI unit of acceleration is meters per second squared. It can be also expressed, in other unit systems, as centimeter per second squared or feet per second squared. To illustrate this, the car in the figure moves initially at a velocity of 10 meters per second accelerates to 25 meters per second in a time interval delta t of 3 seconds. The change in velocity delta v at this time interval is 15 meters per second and dividing this by delta t 3 seconds, therefore, the car accelerates at positive 5 meters per second squared. It means that this car is speeding up by 5 meters per second in every 1 second. If the car continues at this acceleration, then after succeeding one second of movement, its velocity becomes 30 meters per second, 35 meters per second and 40 meters per second and so on. Acceleration is a vector quantity. In one dimensional motion, positive or negative is enough to denote its direction. The sign of acceleration and the initial velocity will dictate whether the object is accelerating or decelerating. Consider the following points. When the initial velocity and acceleration are in the same direction, either both positive or both negative, then the object is accelerating. But when the object's initial velocity and acceleration are in the opposite directions or different signs, the object is decelerating. Beware! It is a misconception that a negative value of acceleration necessarily mean the object is slowing down, if the acceleration and initial velocity are both negative, then the object is speeding up and not slowing down. Another thing to consider is that, the initial velocity is zero when the body is initially at rest while the final velocity is zero when the body stops moving. Another useful motional graph that we are going to consider is the velocity time graph. It is a graph of body's velocity as a function of time. Using this graph, we can easily determine the velocity of a body at specific point in time. For instance, in figure, we can estimate that at 2 seconds. The car is moving at a velocity of around 16 meters per second. Now, 
If we connect two points I and point F of the graph with a diagonal line, we see that the rise is the change in velocity and its run is time interval delta T, and dividing rise by run gives the slope of this line which represents the average acceleration. Here we have a rise of 15 meters per second and a run of 3 seconds, therefore the average acceleration between time interval 0 to 3 seconds is 5 meters per second squared. The type of acceleration that we have discussed in previous section is only the average acceleration at certain time interval. We do not know yet the acceleration of at any specific time. Now we are ready to explore another type of acceleration called instantaneous acceleration. Instantaneous acceleration is the limit of the average acceleration as the time interval goes to zero. It is also the first derivative of the velocity with respect to time. Same thing as we did before in instantaneous velocity, using the velocity time graph, we can determine instantaneous acceleration at any time by constructing a line tangent to the curve at a specific time. The slope of this tangent line represents the instantaneous acceleration at that time. In next section, we shall see a constant instantaneous acceleration, which is represented by a diagonal line on the velocity time graph rather than a curved line. When the instantaneous accelerations are always the same, then object is undergoing a motion called uniformly accelerated motion. OK we give another sample problem. Problem number 6. An astronaut has left an orbiting space shuttle to test a new maneuvering unit. As she moves along a straight line, her partner on board the shuttle measures her velocity every 2 seconds starting at time 1 second, as follows. So here's the table. Letter A, draw the velocity time graph of the astronaut. Letter B, find the average acceleration, for each of the following time intervals, 1 second to 3 seconds, 5 second to 7 second, 9 second to 11 second, and 13 second to 15 second. Describe also whether the astronaut is accelerating or decelerating at each time interval. Letter C, using the constructed graph estimate, the instantaneous acceleration at time 14 second. Again, we are asked to construct the velocity time graph, the average acceleration at specified time intervals and instantaneous acceleration at 14 seconds. We need again a graphing paper to construct the velocity time graph, then plot the velocity of the astronaut at each indicated time. At 1 second, 0.8 meter per second. At 3 second, 1.2 meter per second. At 5 second, 1.6 meter per second. At 7 second, 1.2 meter per second. At 9 second, negative 0.4 meter per second. Negative velocity indicates that at 9th second the astronaut is now moving in the opposite direction. At 11 second, negative 1 meter per second. At 13 second, negative 1.6 meter per second. At 15 second, negative 0.8 meter per second. Then connect the plotted points with a smooth curve. Although the curve is only an estimation, since we are limited with the information, it should look like this. Now we're ready for average acceleration. Average acceleration is equal to change in velocity divided by the time interval. For time interval 1 second to 3 second, the change in velocity is 1.2 minus 0.8 meters per second divided by 3 minus 1 second, will give an acceleration of positive 0.2 meter per second squared. Since the initial velocity and acceleration are both positive, Therefore the astronaut is accelerating during this time interval. From 5 second to 7 second, we have a change in velocity of 1.2 minus 1.6 meter per second divided by 2 seconds time interval. This gives an average acceleration of negative 0.2 meter per second squared. The astronaut is decelerating since the initial velocity and acceleration have different directions or signs. For 9 to 11 seconds, 
The average acceleration is negative 1 minus negative 0.4 divided by 2 second equals negative 0.3 meter per second squared. We see that the initial velocity and acceleration are both negatives, therefore the astronaut speeds up or accelerating at this time interval. For 13 to 15 seconds, dividing the change in velocity of negative 0.8 minus negative 1.6 meter per second by 2 second will give an average acceleration of 0.4 meter per second squared. The initial velocity is a negative while the acceleration is a positive. Therefore the astronaut decelerates in this time interval. I hope you got everything understood. Lastly, for instantaneous acceleration at time 14 second, from the velocity time graph we have constructed a while ago, we draw a line tangent to the curve at 14 second. Then we determine the slope of this line. Careful observations show that the rise is around negative 1 minus negative 1.8 meter per second and the run is 15 second minus 13 second. Finally, we get the acceleration as rise over run, so the acceleration of the astronaut at time 14 second is 0.4 meter per second squared. So that's it. Thank you for listening. You should take a break if you feel exhausted. See you later. At this point, I believe that you have already acquired basic knowledge on motion graphs such as position time and velocity time graphs. The next thing you should possess is to have a clear understanding on how we interpret these graphs. We will take a look on the shape of the lines that can be generated at different situations. Number 1, when the body is at rest, or no relative motion. Number 2, when the body is moving at constant velocity. Number 3, when the body is accelerating at constant rate, and Number 4, when the body is decelerating at constant rate. So let's begin. For no motion or at rest. A body is at rest when its position does not change relative to some frame of reference. Imagine a person standing still and there is a tree which acts as the reference origin. If the person is standing beneath the tree we can say its position relative to the tree is zero. As long as he is not moving, his position remains zero as time goes by. So we see a horizontal line on the timeline of position time graph. When the person is standing still 10 meters right of the tree, this line will be a horizontal line at 10 meters, which is above the timeline. If the person is standing on the opposite side of the tree, then the horizontal line will be below the timeline, at x equals negative 10 meters. In case of velocity time graph, since the person is standing still, therefore its velocity is zero at any time. We see a horizontal line on the timeline regardless on the position of person relative to the tree. For uniform motion or constant velocity, a body is moving uniformly or at constant velocity when a distance as it moves are equal for equal time intervals. Let's say a car is traveling 5 meters every 1 second. At 0 second, the position is 0. 1 second later the car is 5 meters away from position 0. 2 seconds later, 10 meters. And 3 seconds later, 15 meters. Therefore, its velocity is constant 5 meters per second. If a body is traveling towards positive x-axis, the line is sloping upward while a downward slope means that the body is moving towards negative x-axis. For velocity time graph, a horizontal line above or below the timeline of represent this type of motion. Since this car is moving along positive x-axis at constant 5 meters per second, this will give a horizontal line above the timeline. If it is moving along negative x-axis, then the horizontal line is below the timeline. Now for accelerating at constant rate. A body is accelerating when the distances it moves are increasing during equal time intervals. The position time graph shows a parabolic curve with increasing slope. Since this car is moving toward positive x-axis, 
so the curve is drawn above the timeline. But if it is moving towards negative x-axis, the curve is drawn below. For the velocity time graph, let's say that this car increasing its velocity by 5 meters per second for every second, so if it is moving towards positive x-axis, therefore we can construct a diagonal line sloping upward. If it is moving towards negative x-axis, the line is sloping downward. Lastly, for decelerating at constant rate. A body is decelerating when the distances it moves are decreasing during equal time intervals. The position time graph shows a parabolic curve with decreasing slope. The curve is drawn above the timeline if the object is moving towards positive x-axis. And the curve is below the timeline if it is moving towards negative x-axis. The velocity time graph shows a diagonal line which is sloping towards the timeline. Since this car is initially moving fast and gets slower and slower towards positive x-axis, so we can construct a diagonal line which seems to be closer and closer to the timeline. If the body is towards negative x-axis, the velocity becomes less and less negative. Let us answer this problem number 7. The position of an object moving along x-axis varies with time as shown in the figure. Letter A, determine the type of motion in each time interval, indicated by letters, and tell whether the object is moving towards positive x-axis or negative x-axis. Letter B, in what point or points the instantaneous velocity is zero. Letter C, sketch the velocity versus time graph for the object. So again, we are asked to determine the type of motion in each time interval, point or points where the velocity is zero, and a sketch of velocity time graph. Referring to the given position time graph and applying what we have learned from the previous section, we tabulate our answers for clarity. From points A to B, the line is a curve with increasing tangent slope, therefore, the object is accelerating at constant rate and it is moving towards positive x-axis. From B to C, the line is a diagonal sloping upward, so the object has uniform motion or moving at constant velocity and it is still moving towards positive x-axis. At point C, the object begins to decelerate to point D while traveling toward positive x-axis. And momentarily at point D, the object has stopped moving. Then from point D, it begins to accelerate backwards or towards negative x-axis, until point E. From point E, the object decelerates while traveling towards negative x-axis, until it comes to rest at point F. Lastly, at points F to G, since the line is a horizontal, the object maintains at rest. For letter B, at what point the velocity of the object zero? So we try to observe a point on the position time graph where in the slope of the tangent line is zero, hence zero velocity. We can observe four points with that meet the criterion, at points A, D, F and G. At these points the object is at rest or zero velocity. For the velocity time graph, from point A to point B, the type of motion is accelerating so we have a diagonal line sloping upward. From points B to C, constant velocity, so we have a horizontal line. At point C, the object started to decelerate until it stopped at point D. So point D should at the time line. Then the object accelerates backwards so the velocity at point E is a negative value. Finally. It decelerates to point F to a velocity of zero and at point G as well. Take note that this is only a sketch and we cannot determine the value of velocity at each point since we do not have enough information on the values of position from the position time graph. Later, we will see another surprising fact, that the area under the velocity time graph represents the displacement and the total distance traveled by the object.